Good afternoon. I'm Greg Fletcher. I'm program director at the Caltech Y. And on behalf of the Student Activism Speaker Series and the Caltech Center for Inclusion and Diversity, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Uh, thank you for ranking the propositions that you most want addressed. We are going to go in that order. Uh, and Kathleen is going to be checking the chat and potentially reading a question or two after each proposition. Uh, but we're going to move very quickly and try to get through as many of, this, the, many of the propositions as we possibly can. Uh, and in the spirit of that quickness, let me quickly introduce our presenter. Uh, Marna Cornell is the current member and former president of the Pasadena Area League of Women Voters. Marna. Welcome to everybody, and I'm so delighted that you're interested in down ballot, down ballot uh, issues and that you're here. So thank you for coming. And let me just give those of you that don't know anything about the league, let me tell you a little bit about the league. It is a political organization, but it is nonpartisan. And we take no uh, stance on candidates whatsoever. We focus on issues. Now we have two arms. One is education, which is what I'm here to do today. And the other is advocacy, where we take a position on a proposition or on a particular issue. Um, this is an education presentation. You will see when I tell you for and against, the league's name may be included, but I'm not here to tell you why we're voting this way or to persuade you to vote the way we vote at all. And in fact, I haven't even looked it over because I've been trying to give the propositions and myself just learn about it. Um, now, the other thing I want you to know is the information that I give you, we got from the state, and the state does not vet what you see in your ballot and where they give the reasons for and reasons against. They have not been vetted where somebody has said true or false, snoops.com, Politico, Check Facts, none of those organizations, and the league doesn't do that. We're not here to, we take what people say. So beware and look at all the qualifying things that you'll see and in what people say, and also evaluate what people say. You need to be a um, proactive voter. Voting is not a spectator sport, and that's what we like to say. It isn't passive. You need to be there and get involved. So with that, let me start my slide presentation. How to evaluate a ballot proposition. Examine what it proposes. Is it consistent with your idea of what government should be doing or not? Who are the sponsors and the opponents? Where is the funding coming from? I'll give you as much of that as I know, and I'll tell you right off my numbers I got on the 9th. That was the last time I checked them. Is it well written? Or is it confusing and you're not quite sure what it means? Does it create its own revenue source? Uh, does it mandate a program without funding it? Is this an issue that can be improved with a yes or no vote? That's all you get on a proposition, yes or no. Does it amend the Constitution? And if yes, does it belong in the Constitution? And here again, just what I can't stress this enough, beware of half-truths and distortion in advertising about the measure. All right, the first one, I'm going to go according to the list that Greg gave me. And the first one is Prop 22, I believe. Okay. All right. Now this one, let's see if on my screen so I can read my slide and get some of this down a little bit um, or off to the side. All right, Prop 22, it exempts app-based transportation and delivery services from providing employee benefits to certain drivers. This was done by the petition of voters. This did not come from the legislature, however, the legislature <clears throat> did pass a law called AB5 in 2019. And what that law said was that the ability of 
companies to hire workers as independent contractors and that they had to be classified as employees. Well, the companies did not like that. And the companies we're talking about are Uber, Lyft, DoorDash. Um, so they said they got uh, some legal way of saying, we're not going to have AB5 go into effect. We're going to take it to the voters. And so there are two clear, clear ideas in this proposition. Either you think that employees on app based, this isn't all employees everywhere. This is only app based and just transportation and delivery uh, should be treated as independent contractors or you think they should be treated as employees. Now, this proposal uh, has some companies, what they, they are giving out some benefits, they say, to independent contractors. So listen carefully to what they're giving in this ballot measure. It would require app-based companies to pay at least 120% of the minimum wage for each hour spent driving. They have to be driving. Healthcare subsidy, all right? The subsidy is a stipend to drivers. They are not providing healthcare, but they will give them a stipend toward getting their own healthcare. Medical expense. The medical expense would only kick in if a driver is injured while driving. An arrest policy, the measure would restrict drivers from working more than 12 hours a day for a ride share or delivery company. What is happening now is some independent drivers, and a lot of people love doing that, they're working for a couple of companies. They say, I can work, um, I'm getting more business here from them, or it's more convenient for me to work for them, and they can go back and forth. This would limit that. The, um, another thing about this proposition that's really important to understand is they put in there a seven-eighths rule saying that in order to change this proposition, seven-eighths of the Assembly and the State Senate would have to agree to change any of this. Not a simple majority. It would have to be seven-eighths. Uh, this measure would also prohibit workplace um, discrimination. And it would also, and this is something important, it would also prevent local jurisdictions like, say, Pasadena, Glendale, uh, from setting their own rules for rideshare and delivery companies, such as setting a higher minimum compensation. All right, the fiscal impact of this. And again, notice a minor increase in, I'm trying to get this uh, screen off. Okay, a minor increase in state income taxes paid by rideshare and delivery company drivers and investors. All right, now let me give you some of, you can see uh, up there a, a couple of reasons. Let me give you some other reasons. Um, that, oh, one other thing, drivers and fiscal effects, the legislative anal analyst thinks possibly drivers and stockholders would pay more income tax because rides and orders would increase, drivers would earn more money, and because companies would earn higher profits, they would pay more income tax, plus Californians who own stock in say Uber or something, uh, they would earn more money, higher income, and therefore they may pay more income tax. Um, the amount of increased state personal income tax paid by drivers and stockholders is unknown, but it's likely minor. Now, supporters say classifying drivers as employees as required under AB5 would lead to longer wait times, higher prices, and less access to rideshare and delivery services. 
Second reason, like AB5, Prop 22 would improve delivery and ride share work by requiring companies to provide new benefits and expand public safety protections. All right, and three, a lot of people like being independent contractors. They like the freedom that it gives them and they like being work, able to work more on their own hours when they feel like it, etc. Now the opponents say it would eliminate basic workplace protections and it would replace them with a lower guaranteed earnings and health care subsidies to save costs for the company they're only giving subsidies they're not really guaranteeing any medical across the board insurance the current law does not limit driver flexibility and the companies that want this and are paying for it, you'll see when I get to the numbers, uh, they, they are eliminating the flexibility that independent drivers have now. A majority of drivers work 30 or more hours a week. All right, um, so drivers hired as independent contractors, no legal protections or benefits. That's a yes on this. Remember, this is put on by the, the independent Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash against yeah, yes, then not a no. drivers hired as employees, if courts agree, would get standard employee benefits and protections. All right, PRO protects the choice to be independent contractor, saves jobs, provides more earnings, against, denies driver's sick leave, health care, unemployment benefits, workers' compensation, and minimum wage. Now here's the money, and the money on this, and this is just so far, is 186 million, and it is the most money so far, we're told, that has ever been spent on ever, any proposition. And the money is coming from, uh, the major funding is coming from the app-based companies, Lyft, Uber, DoorDash and a coalition of on-demand drivers and platforms, some small businesses, public safety and community organizations. The NAACP of LA is in favor of this and the California Hispanic Chambers of Commerce against <clears throat> the money 13, well, almost 14 million. And it's interesting, the, the public uh, people who have weighed in against this, Vice President Biden, Kamala Harris, where's my arrow, Elizabeth Warren, Dolores Huerta, California Federation of Teachers, SEIU, which is Service Employees International Union, the California Labor Federation, but others, and the main funding from this comes from Brotherhood of Teamsters, Service Employees International Union, which is this SEIU, United Healthcare Workers West, United Food. I can't read it on mine. Um, let's see if I can raise it. Anyway, okay. Uh, let me go back and see if there are any questions on 22. No questions in the chat. Okay. It's a pretty clear choice, I think, on two. All right, 23, moving right along. Now, 23 establishes state requirements for kidney dialysis, and it requires on-site medical professional. Now, a medical professional would be a physician, uh, DO, which is doctor of osteopathy, um, a nurse practitioner. And it came about <clears throat> by petition signatures. And a little background on this. There was a measure about kidney dialysis on the last, I think, 2018. And basically the money comes from SEIU, who has wanted to unionize the employees at these kidney dialysis uh, uh, venues. So here it tells you who it requires. NP is a nurse practitioner physician assistant, on-site during dialysis treatment. 
and no reduction in services without state approval. And you cannot refuse patients based on payment source. Right now, there are about 80,000, I believe, patients that need dialysis. Dialysis is not an optional treatment. It can be three times a week, I think, for about four hours. You must have it or you will die. Um, <clears throat> nurses now administer uh, the treatment. Um, there are no federal laws about this. So um, now the increased state local government costs in tens of millions, that is, um, they would have to um, get pay a doctor. And what, what they're saying, I mean, it's, it's like iffy if this would happen, is that they may have to close. They have about 600 uh, clinics uh, that do this, but if they had to pay a physician on staff at all times, and they work sometimes into the night, um, that that would cost a lot of money. And these patients, because they have to have the treatment, would end up in emergency facilities. So um, that's kind of that's kind of pretty much the basis of this. Uh, it's not really that complicated uh, a proposition, I don't think. Um, now, what happens now is if a patient runs into any problems, they immediately call an ambulance, and then they go, of course, to a regular hospital because these clinics are not, they're set up for dialysis. They're not set up as a hospital for anything. I mean, if you don't feel good and there's a dialysis clinic, you're not gonna walk in there. You've gotta to get to urgent care and emergency room. They are not a hospital, they're very specific. So now when something goes wrong, a nurse calls an ambulance. Um, I could not find anything that said or in any of the literature that these clinics had been uh, sued for not doing things right. Um, but there are people in the, are, that are in favor and say, for safety's sake, they should have a physician on board. Um, now, pros that they would have access to an MD, doctor of apathy during dialysis, better infection control, improved staffing, forbids discrimination based on ability to pay. Uh, if you have private insurance, and you need dialysis, your insurance company is required to pay, um, I think up to 30, mo up 30 months of your treatment. <clears throat> That's two and a half years. Uh, then you go on Medicare or Medicaid. And that way, you may have to pay some of it, but they are not supposed to refuse you uh, that you can't get care. And it is saying uh, against this, it would force community dialysis clinics to close and uh, increase healthcare costs and that it would contribute to physician shortage. Um, you can read this, who's in favor of it? Six million has been put in favor of it. Approximately the Democratic Party. This union is very much, and frankly, I don't understand why they are so behind the physician thing, how it helps them as a union. I'm not clear on that and we couldn't get clear in training, but people do agree it's in the times that they, they keep wanting to unionize and put things on the ballot as a way to unionize. Um, major funding is SEIU and then there's some others. Now against, is about $93.5 million. And it is supported by a broad coalition of doctors, nurses, businesses that feel this is not necessary, chambers of commerce. Now the major funding against it, these are the organizations. They do not want to get a physician because it will raise their cost and they are a business group. Uh, but the question is, is, do they, is, is it needed regardless, and it would raise the cost. Is this really something that is needed? Okay, any questions on this? Still no questions. Okay. 
All right, let me get to 19. 19, and I'll tell you before, I, I find 19 myself um, a confusing one. Um, I've talked to my husband about it, to friends about it, read it over and over, and tr tried to figure it out. Um, let me give you a little um, backstory on it, which kind of explains how it, it came about a little bit. I'm looking for my notes on it. Okay, um, the way uh, property taxes now are decided, it happens when you sell your house. And so if you buy a more expensive house, uh, then you pay more taxes. If you've been renting, obviously you haven't been paying taxes, but you've been paying rent. And it is based on 1% of the rate of, the, of your taxes are 1% of the rate of the house. Now, there have, have been and are many, many wealthy people. And maybe all of you are too young to know about Lloyd Bridges and he had two sons, Bo Bridges. And um, what is the other one? Uh, something Bridges, Jeff Bridges, okay. And so Lloyd Bridges, he used a lot of his money to buy property. So he left the property to his sons. Now they didn't buy it. So the property tax stayed where Lloyd Bridges has it, had invested, say 20 years ago. Now they were only going to live, I, if they did live in on his estate, which was huge, and not pay more taxes, but all the investor investments they had, they rented. Or in or in recent times made them wealthy people have made them into Airbnbs, but they are not paying any more taxes on them. And so it was felt the legislature is the one that is putting this on the ballot. They wanted to close those loopholes for wealthy people who inherited property and just were not, were not living on it mostly and were um, getting making a lot of money from it. And they thought the state, we need more, they need to pay their fair share of property taxes. And then they threw in a few things that kind of to sweeten the bill. And it is a constitutional amendment. And that's because it changes Prop 13, which is in the constitution of California. And many people think our constitution's terrible now. Um, it shouldn't have all these propositions, but that is the way the system we have now. So let me just go through some of these things that they, that is in this. It's a proposition with not, um, to me, there are many factors in it. A yes means many, many things will happen and a no means many things will not happen. It's not a, it's not a simple thing. Uh, like, do you get a physician or do you not get a physician? That's a one time, one decision. All right, so right now, if you are 55 and over 55 like me, and we sell this house that I live in, we would get the same property tax on our new home. Say we move to a retirement home or whatever, and it costs more money than uh, what we had paid for this. Uh, or, or this is worse, it wouldn't matter. We would get uh, the, the same property tax. The person who buys our house will have to pay 1% of that. But what if our new house is now, values have gone up, probably it costs more, or we do it to move near family or something, we would keep the same tax base. This law says over 55, you can move three times. So you can downsize when the kids go and have kind of a smaller house. And then one of your kids moves to San Diego and they decide you should be near, they need help with the kids. Well, we'll move down there. And then you decide, oh my gosh, you have some kind of physical disability. And one of your kids is in the um, uh, health business and, and says, come live near us. We've got all the facilities for you you could take that base from your very first house with you. It will also allow disabled or wildfire disaster victims to transfer primary residence tax base to a replacement residence, but only once. And we know we have horrible fires here and people lose their homes. And so um, 
this way when they rebuild if they rebuild the same place or wherever they rebuild their tax base will stay the same even if they were in that house for 20 years and rebuilding costs them more and the new house is worth more they still keep their tax base that's disabled same thing okay now this is where it gets a little dicey i think is changes taxation of family property transfers so let me read you some other things that this does um so you can eliminate the transfer of taxable values of an inherited property but if it is your principal residence then you get to keep the same uh the same taxable value so for example your parents leave you their house and they bought the house say for uh two hundred thousand dollars many many years ago and now it is worth um eight hundred thousand dollars or something you do not have to pay tax on eight hundred thousand dollars you are living in it and you get the same tax base that they had at at uh, two hundred thousand dollars say one percent like two thousand dollars or something not eight thousand dollars as for the property that it is worth now now and that is for a principal residence you have to live in it or a farm and um but it would provide an upward tax assessment adjusted for inflation after february 16th 2023 to owner occupied inherited properties with a market value more than one million greater than its taxable value so take that home that your parents paid for and paid two hundred thousand dollars for and say they did that 40 years ago and say now that home is worth 1.3 million dollars it's over one million dollars from what they paid for it this is how i interpret it so you can see you would have to pay taxes on that value so let me say it again if it's now worth uh 1.3 million your taxes would be 1300 so um that's oh, I, sorry i think i was on my keyboard um now the increased tax revenue would establish file fire protection service fund and they talk about in the literature of uh, fire suppression and my understanding is that fire suppression is different from your um local fire department those are people that work at maybe doing burns in the national forest they are the people that get called in when we have these horrible fires and i'll tell you frankly one of the things it says it will go to it will help schools and local governments and i'm not sure about that except maybe if people move more you will have more housing stock and um and there it will help local taxes i'm not a hundred percent um understanding that so it does say local governments and schools will gain millions from this now yes homeowners as above are eligible for property tax savings only inherited properties used as primary homes and farms are eligible for property tax savings no reassessment to market value will force families to sell their property because they cannot afford higher property taxes okay i i, I think this one is you know you can't go to sleep on this one guys you got to read it and read it okay um the pro again limits taxes on seniors disabled wildfire victims and it closes unfair tax loopholes used by wealthy out-of-state investors and it protects the prop 13 savings that's another thing that they wanted to close the loophole because there are people that are out of state very wealthy they're trying to get money from the very wealthy who bought a vacation home here 
see. And they bought it up in Lake Arrowhead or Tahoe or someplace. And it's gone way, way up in value. And they rent it out and they, or they use it as an Airbnb and they're making a lot of good money on it. I mean, they still have expenses for some upkeep, but their tax base has not changed. And so they are trying through this to get money from wealthy out of state investors, as well as, you know, Hollywood people and, and maybe um, tech people or some people that have, have been around more for years and years. Maybe not, maybe not as much tech as Hollywood kinds of people. Against, it's a tax increase on families and it would be on some takes away the right to pass without an increase in taxes. And it does take that away in some cases. Okay, the yes is 40 million, 40.7 million. I, I keep losing my arrow. 40.7 million dollars. And the firefighters, they want more money. Realtors, of course, because if pe people can move and change, they'll get more commissions. Seniors, disabled homeowners and wildfire victims. Now, um, there, uh, some of these people already had, I think it maybe it was a wildfire that weren't on others. I'm not entirely clear about that. Major funding is from the California Association of Realtors and Professional Firefighters. So this money is for professional firefighters. And of course, that's something that's very much on our mind in California these days. And against is the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, and they've just raised 45,000. Okay, I know this is complicated. Questions, I'll try to answer them. <laughs> uh, we don't have any questions on this one. Uh, but we do have a question going back to the proposition about dialysis clinics. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. So someone's asking, uh, how do other countries do this kind of care? And is it typical to have an MD on staff outside of the U.S.? You know, I don't have an answer. And I think that's a very good question. I, I, that's a really good question. It would be good to re research that on the internet. I do know that it's not a federal requirement. But you know, that doesn't mean maybe other states do it differently. I think that raises a good question. So I would suggest, you know, googling that. Anything else? No other questions. Okay, um, Prop 15, okay. Prop 15 is another, um, let's see, pro is uh, another one on property taxes. And this one, okay. This one has had a lot of misleading ads. I haven't watched many of the ads, but when we were in training, they were saying that, uh, the league was getting a lot of calls on this because there was a lot of misinformation. So remember I said that Prop 13 is a uh, constitutional amendment. And so that is why this one um, would actually, um, it's an initiative, it comes from the people, but it would change the constitution. And so let me just give you some background on Prop 13. Okay, Prop 13 came in in about 1978. And at that time, it was the big impetus behind it was that because uh, the values of the homes in California were going up so fast and homes were getting reassessed and so much more property tax that seniors in particular were getting priced out of their homes that they'd been in for 30, 40 years because it costs so much more and their social security and retirement just didn't cover constant raising of their property tax. Your property tax can go up 2% a year, all right? So Prop 13 was passed, which said, if you, however you paid for your, the, the sale price of your house for would still be 1% of that kind of forever. It would not be increased. It would only be increased 
um, uh, 2% a year, not on, based on what the market value was. And they were, it was being assessed, I'm sorry, I was con confusing. Market value was being assessed on people's homes every year and they were going up. So their taxes were going up gigantically. But this said, your taxes cannot be increased more than 2% a year. And when you buy a home, 1% is what it is, is, the pri is your property value, not the market value, all right? And there are two pots. There's residential, and then there is commercial. Well, in 1978, 50% of property taxes were paid by residential homeowners, and that includes condominiums and renters, anything residential. So renters, you would not pay that directly, but your landlord would pay it, and your rent would be, you know, based on that. So 50%. Commercial was giving 50% of property tax money. Then fast forward to about 2017 and things changed. Residential was now providing 71% of property tax money and commercial, which would be business or industrial was only providing 29%. So people felt that isn't fair because property taxes help pay for public schools, your roads, um, um, fire departments, please your local governments, and that, uh, and that um, all those services, the commercial industrial businesses are getting, and they're only paying 29% now. And that happened because um, residential turned over more than com commercial and business. I mean, where I live in just a modest part of Pasadena, there's a house here that has sold in the last five years five times. Not, not, it's not a speculator's house or anything like that. It's, it's people changed. A single mom wanted to move near her, her boyfriend. And then somebody wanted, their son got interested in, in a pool and, and they just didn't feel their backyard was big enough for the kind of pool they wanted, a big pool, so help his sport interest. And then the next people were supposed to be here forever. And he got a startup offer in San Diego. And every time that house sold, even in the last five years or so, the price went up and the property taxes went up for the new owner. Now I live near, maybe some of you know, like Stater Brothers and used to be Vaughn's. I don't think that that's, that, tenants have just turned over once in 30 years. We've been in our house 30 years. So um, it just created that discrepancy. So that's what brought on Prop 15, is what they want to do is to tax commercial industrial properties at their current market value, not what the original sale was. And versus that should have been purchase price. Now there is a carve out for small businesses. Okay. So people understood that small businesses cannot afford to have their property tax reassessed every three years. So if you are a small business owner and your what you own is $3 million or less, this does not apply to you. You would be in the pot with the residential people. Also, if you have less than 50 employees. So the, the purpose is not to, in, to hurt um, small business at all. The purpose is to get more funding for public schools, community colleges, and local government services by changing the tax assessment only for business and commercial property that is worth more than $3 million and has um, 
less more than 50 employees is um, also there's another carve out here other businesses would not pay taxes on the first 500,000 of their personal property and um, so or farms that's part of this too I think it says up there someplace so they try to balance this so that what the thought is that commercial and industrial would pay their big share. And the advertising that says, well, this is going to change Prop 13 and they're going to come after your residential thing. It's a lot of scare tactics and only half truths. This doesn't deal at all with residential. There's nothing in here about residential. It's business. It's small business. You might not think they're being taxed too much or something. And the three million is should be ingested for inflation too. So the goal is to make property taxes fair for everybody. So you here you see more <clears throat> properties more than three million. And this is a guest estimate, but the billions in new funding to local governments and schools. So Here's your yes, property taxes will go up, but only for that pot, commercial, industrial. No, it will remain the same. No new funding for local governments or schools. It closes property tax loopholes, benefiting wealthy corporations and reclaims billions for schools and local communities. It, the intent is to get the money from about 10% of the big corporations that own a lot of commercial industrial property in the state. No, 12.5 billion, they're guessing, property tax increase that will raise the cost of living. And it repeals taxpayer protections in Prop 13. Remember, they're only talking about commercial and industrial. All right, um, there's a lot of heat on this, a lot of advertising, a lot of difference, difference of opinion. And you can see 47.9 million, and maybe by now it's 48 million for yes on Prop 15. Uh, Joe Biden's weighed in on Kamala Harris, the League of Women Voters is for it, Secretary of State uh, Alex Padilla, community political organizer. I'm not sure who this is. The major funding comes from California Teachers Association. And really, I suspect most of the money comes from Zuckerberg, which is Facebook and SEIU. And no, 37, say 0.5 million, multiple state and local business organization, chambers of commerce, builders, Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, state and local politicians. Major funding is from the California Business Roundtable, California Taxpayers Association. And I guess this is a writ is a um, some kind of a real estate group. Okay, any questions on this? Yes, we have a couple here. Okay. Um, first is, uh, does anyone know what the worth of most restaurants are? So how many local restaurants would be affected by this proposition? That's a good question. And I don't know the answer to that. I would expect uh, it depends on their, where they're located. Okay. Um, the other one is, how do you know that the extra money actually goes to schools and other public services? Well, it is built into that. It is said in here that the proposal says that if this passes, it has to, that's where it would go, that it would go to those things. Um, I'm not sure it would go, 60%, uh, here is the statistic, 60% would be distributed to local governments. And which is like 3.9 to 6.9 billion because nobody knows exactly what will come in. The remainder, 2.6 to 4.6 billion, would go to schools and community colleges. And that is built into this proposition. I mean, if it should pass, that's where the money 
goes. They can't use it um, uh, to build new, new freeways, for example. They can't use it to uh, pave new streets. They can't use it for salaries for local government. It has to go to those things if this passes, whatever amounts of money that that does come in. And nobody's exactly sure because I don't know, you know, what the, like you said about restaurants and things, I'm not sure. And that would depend on, you know, are they tenants in there? And if this passes, would the owners try to pass um, on the cost of their new taxes in their rents to tenants? So that's something to consider because they probably would. I mean, that's sort of common sense, right? They probably would. I don't know. I'm not. I don't own commercial buildings, but I would think if the commercial building had tenants, they might, depending on the tenants, if they might try to pass that on up their rent a little. Anything else? I think that's it. Um, well, there is one more question since we sure. haven't had some others. We will grab one more. Sure. Uh, sure. When would this go into effect? Uh, meaning, would it hit businesses already struggling? due to the pandemic or is there some lag time? Oh, that's a good question. And let me see if it says in here, um, if there's a date on it. Um, I haven't seen a date. So that most commercial, that's a good question. Um, and I don't see, uh, I don't see a date here. That would be something to Google because I know in some other things, there's a bond issue on stem cell things and that, you know, some of them put in dates and say, no, it won't go into effect, but I don't, I don't see where that says this. Um, so I think that's a very good question and I'm sorry, I can't answer it. Um, Okay. All right, are we ready to move on? Yes, I think so. Yeah, that would be a good thing to, to Google. I would think in line uh, with the pandemic. Someone in the chat uh, just Googled it, it looks like, and um, Prop 15 would be put in place over time starting in 2022, it says. Oh, good. Okay. I'm glad to know that. So it wouldn't start right away and it would be over time. All right. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. So 22, that gives us a couple years to recover, doesn't it? Which we pray we will. Okay. Um, all right. The next one is 20. Okay, this one is uh, restricts parole for, for certain offenses. The background on this is kind of interesting. Back in, um, you know, you're, you're young and you may not remember or, or been following things, but um, the federal government came down very hard on California because they said, we have too many people in prison for our facilities. It's unfair. It's not okay. And we were taken to court for that. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And at that time, I think Jerry Brown was governor. Um, and um, it was maybe in, uh, in the past decade, there was AB 109, 2011, Prop 47, you may remember that, that was 2014, and you maybe vote, have been voting then, and then Prop 57 in 2016. And all of those were intended to reduce the state prison population, as had been ordered in district court, but it was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. So the best that the state could do, and I guess they negotiated with the federal government, 137.5% of capacity is what was allowed. Now that means in some places, 
it's more crowded than 137 and it may be less, maybe it'd be 125 in some others. It was very hard to get um, less people in our prisons. So laws were passed, propositions came out. Prop 47 in 2014, that was a big one, redefined certain nonviolent, non-serious felonies as misdemeanors unless the defendant had previous convictions for certain violent crimes, and it allowed resentencing for people convicted for the redefined offenses. Prop 57, which was the latest one in 2016, increased opportunities for parole for people convicted of nonviolent felonies who had completed the sentence for their primary offense. So um, this, is, this is a reaction, I would say, to those laws. You know, in many things, uh, the pendulum swings. This is a good law, and then, no, we don't think it's so good, this program, let's go the other way. And then it swings back. And so this is swinging back to putting more people, um, authorized felony sentences for certain offenses currently treated only as misdemeanors. So they're called wobblers. So a prosecutor, before it would just be a misdemeanor which means usually you will be in jail, in the county jail, and not a felony. Felony means you would go to prison and your sentence is probably longer. So if you're in trouble, it's better to have a misdemeanor than a felony. But this is classifying it back to more felony offenses. And um, it's, a, it's a reaction to what happened when they lowered penalties. And so that's kind of the backstory on this one. And he, the prosecutor would decide. Um, so, and there have been complaints from many markets. Where was I reading? Albertsons. I, I can't remember exactly, but that there are kind of serial crime and that there's more organized retail crime now. Maybe not more violent crime, but maybe more organized retail crime. And, and so there should be harsher sentences for that. So Prop 20 creates a list of criteria for the Board of Parole hearings to use in considering whether to grant parole to an inmate convicted of a nonviolent crime under the provisions of Prop 57. And uh, prosecutors could review the information and review the board's decision and um, victims' families could participate in that. So Prop 20 expands the list of crimes classified as violent crimes in order to exclude those crimes from the provisions of Prop 57. So you're making things more serious for people. And it's a reaction for what was done before. And the fiscal effects are difficult to estimate. So because it would result, it's obviously going to result in putting more people in prison. And it would change the way post-release release supervision is handled. If you, are, um, if you are in a state prison, it's parole and not probation. Uh, and it, it might ensure that people convicted of these crimes would serve their full sentences instead of being released on parole, as many are. Prop 20, and the, uh, that, this is what, um, it will help stop car break-ins, shoplifting. And that's what a lot of retail people have complained about. And other theft, theft that has been on the rise. It will class, reclassify certain crimes like assault with a deadly weapon, date rape, and child abuse as violent. Okay. Now the opponents say it will roll back prison reforms and it will cost taxpayers millions of dollars annually. 
It will slash mental health and rehabilitation programs that help to prepare people for release from prison and reduce and repeal offenses. Re no, reduce repeat offenses. It will result in extreme sentences for petty theft and will disproportionately impact vulnerable minorities. So this, this prop has, um, uh, there's a lot of controversy about this. Okay. Uh, increase, not increase. It closes the loopholes. Oh, and it's early. Mandates more DNA uh, connect, uh, collection. And that's another piece of it, which I should read to you or tell you about. That they, they say in here, they will connect. It requires the collection of DNA from people con convicted of a variety of crimes, including some crimes that were redefined as misdemeanors by Prop 47. Against, it's a prison spending scam. It's scaring people. Already have severe long prison sentences for violent crime. Excuse me, that's my landline. I haven't known what to do about that. Okay, I took it off and it rang anyway. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, prison spending scam, scaring people. Already have severe long prison sentences for violent crime. More spending on prison. So that's the against. So you really have two different points of view and it's very interesting, the people involved and the money involved in this one. This one, the pro doesn't have a lot of money. Um, I, I don't know who this person is. Uh, yes on 20, keep it safe. Criminal prosecuting attorney, attorneys, victim rights advocates, personal story, major funding, Sheriff Employees Benefit Association. Now, against is about 6.5 million. And Jerry Brown is against it, the former governor, because the reforms came under him. And he does not want to see them roll back. The League of Women Voters is against this. ACLU is against this. California Teachers Association, California Democratic Party. Here's SEIU again in California Labor. Stop the prison spending scam. Uh, major spending again, notice is from Facebook. Who does, he, he think he's not in favor of this uh, rolling back parole things. So any questions on this one? Uh, there was just one question that you answered as you went through. So I think we're good. Okay, so this one is 20. And I have the next one as 21. So let's just go one ahead. Spans local. Oh, this is, this is very, probably all of you already have opinions on this in, in ways because you're dealing a lot with rental property. Um, this, this is very controversial. Um, this would expand local government authority that they could en enact rent control on residential property. And it was put on the ballot by uh, petition signatures. Um, it's an initiative. There was one, I think, in 2015, uh, Prop 10, and it went down. So generally speaking, the people who want rent, and rent control in California put this back on. Now, something I'm not 100% clear about is that um, Governor Newsom did in 2019 pass something saying 5% was the most uh, people could charge to raise the rent. So it seems like that's for the whole the whole state. So I'm not quite clear how this would work because this would allow local governments. This is saying local people, any city um, can pass their own ordinance. Pasadena could pass its own, Alhambra could pass its own, uh, Sierra Madre could pass its own to establish rent control on residential property more than 15 years old. 
So if it's new in the last 15 years, no rent control. The way it is now is of something called Costa Hawkins. And you may have heard of that. And Costa Hawkins said from 1995, you couldn't have rent control. So they're trying to change it a little. The fiscal impact potential reduction in state local revenues in tens of millions of dollars. Revenue losses could be less. Um, cities, counties apply more kinds of rent control than currently. State law would maintain current limits on rent control um, applied by uh, state current livings, it would just be with what we have now. Now, pretty much you all know this because you're in, you're probably a lot of you ran. The state, we don't have enough housing. The supply of housing is not enough to keep rents affordable for many people. Uh, we have five of the top seven metropolitan areas with the highest average monthly rents are in our state. Uh, and renters cannot afford these amounts. According to U.S. Census, more than 56% of tenant families in California spend 30% or more of their income on rent. And you're not supposed to spend more than 30% on rent, but it just is impossible for many, many people. And um, last year, Governor Newsom did sign a law that caps rent increases statewide at 5% plus inflation annually for most rental housing older than 15 years. So it's a little bit similar to this proposition. And it's one of the strongest policies of its kind in the country. Still, at 5%, that is allowing rents to rise much faster than incomes and probably faster than inflation. And um, especially now in the wake of the fallout from the coronavirus. So it's a really hard thing and it's a really controversial thing. And I'm sure many of you may all already have your opinions on this because you're struggling with it when I hear what people pay for rents in Pasadena, we've been here for years and have our house. I'm appalled and my neighbors, their kids can't leave their home because they can't afford to rent. They can't afford to live on their own. And they, you know, they're out of college, they have graduate degrees and they just, it's just too expensive if they, they're a close family, um, if they stay here. So I think you pretty much understand what is at stake here. Uh, change needed to address, we all know there's a huge homeless population problem here, and it guarantees reasonable profit for landlords. That is built into this law. Now, it also says single family homes who are owned by landlords who own one or two properties. So my husband and I don't own any property, but if we did and we had bought as an investment uh, a couple of, of rental properties, uh, it wouldn't affect us. So there's saying that, again, this is, this is more aimed at big investors and big corporate. Um, they say, I cannot vouch for this, that a lot of the apartments and things in, and you all may know more about this, are in Pasadena area are owned by large corporations. Um, and they're making plenty of money off of it. The other part to this is saying when a vacancy, if someone moves out, there is vacancy control. And when someone moves back in, they cannot raise the rent more than up to 15% during the first three years when a new renter moves in. Um, now the fiscal effects, um, again, you know, this is a guess thing. It says some landlords would sell their rental housing to new owners who would live there. The value of rental housing would decline. Uh, some landlords would receive less rental income. Some renters would move less often because if you don't move, your rent stays the same and you're afraid if you move, you'd have to pay more. The overall 
nobody really knows. I mean, all that's kind of guessing is the way I look at it. The overall effects would depend on how many communities pass new laws and how many properties are covered and how much rents are limited. And I think that's the basis. Nobody knows. This would just give governmental entities, uh, cities, the authority to pass rent control, but what that means, there's just a wide, wide um, spectrum on what rent control means. Um, now, this says against, it would undermine statewide rent control law, that's Gavin Newsom, it would cost jobs, would reduce home values, it would stop new housing starts, and would eliminate homeowner protection. Okay, this one also is very interesting. A lot of people have weighed in on this. There's a fair amount of money in it. Um, so the yes, the renters and homeowners will want to keep families in their homes and that's about 28 million. Um, Dolores Huerta Foundation, Kevin DeLeon, he used to be pr uh, president of the state senate consumer watchdogs, social security works, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders, and this is the only proposition I've seen his name on, U.S. Representative Maxine Waters in favor of this, um, SEIU, California Democratic Party, California Teachers Association, and the major funding, and I think this is very interesting, and I don't really understand it in training, we've asked nobody. Um, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation is putting the money, a lot of this money, and they did Prop 10. They're very, they're taking their money, and I think they're headquarters is up north in San Francisco. They're putting a lot of money into this. Now against 56.3 million, so there is more against, both of the mayors that are running in Pasadena, if you vote in Pasadena, neither one of them are in favor of rent control. I think that's very interesting. Governor Newsom is not in favor. The NAACP is not in favor. AMVETS, California Council of Affordable Housing, diverse coalition of builders, chambers of commerce, veterans, seniors, businesses, civil rights organization, unions, Howard Jarvis taxpayers, and major funding, of course, is from a lot of the big realty companies. Any question on this? Questions? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Yeah, that that gives it's it's kind of a clear choice of one's philosophy. Um, uh, something did actually just pop up. Okay. So um, there is a quote from Alice Huffman uh, with the NAACP saying Prop Twenty One encourages landlords to evict tenants. Um, can you explain what that means? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, it, it, she is, this is what I think. I cannot read her mind, uh, so I'm just guessing. Um, uh, is that if they evict tenants, then they can raise the rent. That would give them, if there was rent control, they could raise the rent under a vacancy. I have also heard, and I'm just pat this. I'm just passing on what I've heard. That the reason uh, the NAACP uh, people have been surprised is against rent control, is that in Black families, um, one way of of getting wealth for them over the years has been to own property, and it's been their way of of saving for their retirement. There, maybe they didn't have jobs which had good retirement policies. And so that is what I have heard about NAACP being against it. But you can see if, uh, if there is rent control, um, first of all, it, it, uh, it's only on certain buildings, but if there is rent control, um, people could, if there was a vacancy, they can raise the rent. So if they have a rent at a certain figure and they want to get 
more rent for it and they know the market can do that they might think of a way well how can i get them out because then i can raise the rent so that could be that i i i don't know for sure it's a real touchy issue and um it seems to me and again this is just me not speaking for the you know anything just what i've heard the discussions and different things is that there are two schools of thought and that comes down to the mayors they they say some people say if you have rent control you're going to developers won't come in and they're not going to build more housing so you're not the way to get rents down is more housing stock and you can see if there was more housing here you you know supply and demand in this in the state or certainly where people wanted to live, then prices go down. But if, and, but they're saying if you want to include development people to come in, but then the other side is California, I mean, Pasadena has seen a lot of developers come in over the years, if you've been at Caltech for a while, and you've watched the new buildings go up. Mostly, they're not what you would call affordable housing. The rents are very high to buy the condos. It's very high. So it's just, do you think if you don't have rent control, you will get more people doing that? Will rent control keep developers out who might build some more housing stock, which would bring down rents? I don't know. I mean, I'm not taking either side, but it seems like the philosophy behind it. That's kind of the philosophy. I hope that helps. Okay. Is are we ready to go on? Yeah, there are no more questions. No more questions. Okay. Yeah, some of these are hard, aren't they? Kind of to see. Okay. 25 is another one. Yeah, uh, it's clear what is what you vote for, but um, uh, the reasons behind it and which one you think is a good way to go is not always clear. Okay, let's see, let me see. Okay, this is on cash bail. This, this proposition is unusual because it's a referendum on a law that replaced money bail in the um, legislature. The legislature passed a law SB 10. And they said, we want cash bail. We want to get rid of cash bail. We do not want bail. So the bail companies, and I don't know, I read someplace and I don't quote me on this, please. There's something like 2300 or something of them in the state. I mean, it's a big business in a way. Um, that is just specialized. That's what they do. And if this had passed, they were going to be out of business because there was going to be no more cash bail. So they did whatever you have to do. And they said, I, I, we do not like this law. You can't make us follow this law. We're going to take it to the people. And we want what they want you to vote do is vote no on this. Because if you vote no, it will keep the cash bail system and the bail owners do not want that. Now, um, yes means you do want cash bail. Yes, yes is on uh, to keep cash bail. Now, bail uh, is money people pay to get out of jail, but it's before they have been tried. It's a pre-trial. And the problem that people have found that don't like bail is first of all they haven't been it hasn't been proven that they're guilty uh second of all while they're in there they may lose their job uh they a wage owner from their family uh will be gone it hurts the families um it impacts poor people the most because if you're very rich you come up them for the money for bail and how bail works is if you get it's 10% of whatever you borrow. So if your bail is set by the court at $20,000, you need to repay $2,000 whether you are guilty or not. So um, that is 
that is the big dilemma. And all over the country, uh, people are uh, in justice circles, people are talking about, is bail fair? And so our legislature said, no, in 2018, bail is not fair. It hurts poor people and we need to eliminate it. Now, um, what they said though, is that you have to have some system for two main causes. In order to let people out of jail, you have to be sure it does not hurt public safety. They are not a menace in any way to the safety of the public. And the second thing is they are not a flight risk. So it, if you don't have bail, it does not mean anybody's going to get out of jail. What is proposed is to have an algorithm, which would be a formula that each county would come up with to prove they would be maybe low, medium, and high. This person is a very low risk to public safety. This person is a very low flight risk. Let's let him out of jail. He has no record. There's no violent things against him. Uh, it wasn't a crime of violence. Uh, he, he's, he's not gonna, you know, leave the, leave the country. So those are the things that are to be considered. Now, then there are people that say, no, that an algorithm uh, might not be a great thing. It might not be fair for everybody. So here, approve or reject a law replacing money bail with a system based on an assessment of public safety and a flight risk. Now, the fiscal impact and again, it would increase costs hundreds of millions annually for a new process, but at that could be offset by tens of millions reduced county jail costs. Now, yes, no one pays bail to be released before trial, and, but you are only released or based on a risk of another crime or a risk of not appearing in court. No. Some people continue to pay bail, others not. You keep the prison system. Fees continue to be charged as a condition of release. So that's basically it. And um, uh, I mean, there are certain things you're not gonna get out of jail. It, it's arrested like a death penalty case or uh, uh, domestic violence or you, they think you, it, it had something to do with a violent crime. So that's, uh, that's, I think it's pretty clear what you're voting for or against, but the reasons and how they will do it. None of these algorithms have been um, uh, set yet. Somebody, people do have to write them and decide how to do that. Okay, now here, if you're in favor, bail with a fair, safer, less costly process. Current process is discriminatory and they mean this discriminatory in terms of money. I mean, we all read in the papers about these uh, celebrities that are accused of huge crimes and they're out on million dollar bail and they, they have the money to put up uh, for that to get out of jail and poor people just do not. Um, okay. Now, it was written by Sacramento politicians, and that is true. It was written by the legislature. That's kind of a pejorative way of putting it, but it was written by the legislature uh, to take away options to post bail. And some people think it, the system will turn out to be discriminatory system of computer gener generated profiling, and it will cost millions of tax dollars. Um, you know, it's interesting, I, I belong to an organization called Women in Leadership and, and the majority of the people in there are African American and when we talked about this, there was just huge debate on it and many of them feel uh, it is discriminatory, they're worried about anything that, that would come up that uh, an algorithm that would not favor would be discriminant against African Americans. Now there is nothing in the language about race or anything. It's all about flight or things. But um, 
anyway, it was interesting and the organization ultimately did decide to do yes on this, but there was huge debate. And at one time, somebody, people said, it's our family. We are, we're arguing over the dinner table over this. Is this going to hit, is this going to hurt African Americans or is it not? So it, it has generated a lot of, um, a lot of discussion and conflict really. So four, yes on 25 and money bail. And it's almost 12 million, probably now it's 12 million. Large number of democratic officials, the California Democratic Party, here is SEIU, California Teachers, California Medical Association, League of Women Voters, California Legislative Black Caucus. Now remember, this came out of the legislature and it is the bond companies, the bail companies that put it on the ballot. And so they want you to vote no. Um, Western Center on Law and Poverty, Congresswoman Karen Bass, Congressman Ted Lieu, he's from Northern California, Mental Health Association of California, California, being in jail can't be good for your mental health. Okay, major funding from International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Here's SEIU again, United Food and Commercial Workers Local, 770. Against, no on 25. Stop the unfair, unsafe, and costly ballot proposition. And they've got about six million dollars. And it's interesting, the California NAACP is against this, where the Black Caucus in the legislature was for it. Howard Jarvis taxpayers, United Latinos vote, California peace officers, crime victims. Now the major funding, I, I've never heard of any of these companies, but they are all bond companies, gay, bail companies, because they will be put out of work. And when you see it will cost jobs. That's what they're talking about. It will stop an industry, one industry. Okay, are there any questions about that? Yes, we've got a couple. Okay. Um, so first one is just asking for clarification. Since the legislature already passed SB 10, what happens if people vote no on this proposition? If people vote no on this proposition, uh, then it, if that will end that there if they vote no we will still have cash bail because they got permission to put it before to override the legislature so if you vote no on this we will still have bail and that's what the bail industry the referendum is saying we didn't like this law we want you to vote this SB 10 down and we want you to vote no the referendum is a referring back to a law, SB 10. Okay. Um, the other question is, how do the annual costs work with using the algorithm? Where do they come from? Well, the, I, I don't think anybody knows. Every county is going to have to come up with an algorithm that will um, provide public safety and, and uh, eliminate as best people can a flight risk. Because even with bail, I guess, you, you, it, you don't pay for the cost of bail. I guess if you were a flight risk and you had bail at $10,000 and you left the country, uh, theoretically, you'd owe $10,000, you know, because you, you had left the country. But um, if you're still here, you would owe $1,000. So no one has come up with the algorithm, this of yet. So I think it will take some time and I would think counties would start working on it and they would look around the country and see New York is doing this. And um, I read a statement from, I think it was Governor Cuomo saying, you know, it, it, we're trying this out because there is a lot of sentiment in the, justice community, uh, maybe um, I would say restorative justice community, saying bail is just not fair. It hurts poor people, wh whoever those people are. And um, they haven't, nothing's been proven against them. And so 
different, I, I, I don't know. And I'm not sure, but it will cost. I mean, they'll have to have people and I, they'll take it from their local governments or whatever to come up with an algorithm that will work. It does say here, <clears throat> which I thought was good, is that um, while those deemed a high risk would remain in jail, but they would have a chance to argue for their release before a judge. So if you are denied bail, still you could get a law, I mean, denied being released and there's no bail to get you out. Um, you could have uh, go before a judge and have your lawyer argue that you're not a flight risk or you're not a, a dangerous person and get you out. But what the cost, nobody knows, you know? Nobody knows. It could end up that some people, there would be less people in jail because people who, who before could not afford bail and stayed in jail I mean, they had to have their meals, they had to have people taking care of them, they had to be watched, they had all, all this. And if, they, if people can say, okay, there's 10 arrests or something in, in this small, and we think eight of them are okay, they're going to come, come back and they're not a flight risk, it's their first DUI or whatever. I, I don't know enough about the legal system to know which ones might be eligible. But they would, that would cost less. They might end up with less people in county jail waiting for trial. You know, I don't know. Those are the only questions for this one. Okay, that's okay. all. And actually we're, uh, we're running up to 1.30 here. So I wanted Good. to jump in. Uh, Marna, maybe you can bring up your slide with uh, the resource sites. Um, yeah, let me. Once we, once we uh, conclude here and close out the recording, I uh, just want to let you know we'll keep the, we'll keep things open here. If folks want to stick around and discuss or ask more questions or get into it a little bit, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but I wanted to quickly just take a moment to thank Marna for being here, presenting for all the research that you've done on this and all the reading. We know how long it takes to just read through all these propositions ourselves and the extra time and work that you're spending to, to put into this and the league, of course, is just uh, very appreciated. And thank you for making us uh, more informed and more responsible citizens, hopefully. But, well, thank you for having me. And I can send you a PDF and let me give you one more site that isn't on here. It's called calmatters.org, C-A-L-M-A-T-T-E-R-S.org. They give uh, like one minute things on ballot issues, but they, they break it down pretty simply. Um, they have a little bit of a point of view, but I think that uh, it's a good resource to have. Great. Uh, Athena, you can